Welcome to Cannabis 360, your source for cannabis and psychedelic industry news, interviews, and insights. Visit Canna360.ca and sign up to receive free access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog. Samantha, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the work you do and kind of how you're involved in either the cannabis or the psychedelic industry here? Certainly. Um, I'm Samantha. I trained as a chemist, but got really, really tired of being a chemist quickly when I moved into industry. So I started helping startups get, get going um, almost instantly. What I do in this space is pretty much helping early stage companies uh, assess their portfolio of assets and, and move towards some critical value inflection point. Um, I spent two years with a startup in this space. Um, I have some experience in the cannabis space just because, you know, back in 2018, many chemists were recruited from pharma and manufacturing into that sphere. So I have some um, experience for sure with, with companies there, but uh, what I do now really is focused on um, due diligence for companies that are uh, drug development adjacent, but also psychedelics adjacent. So really trying to break into a space that has already flourished. Um, and I work with VCs um, uh, to help them kind of gauge where the prospective companies are. Um, and I do some project work for uh, some of the companies in this space as well as a consultant. Beautiful. Well, yeah, you said consultant once, but chemist twice. So Alex is getting the next nod for introductions here. Yes, I'm Alexander Samuelson, uh, better known as Alex the Chemist. Um, I was also a board chemist in industry. Um, couldn't really find a lot of work. And at the same time, um, was on uh, a couple of different pharmaceuticals just to help with things that were going on in life. Got into the medical cannabis space. Didn't really touch cannabis beforehand. And as a chemist, board out of chemist work, uh, board um, out of work chemist with the internet, I thought, hey, I'll learn about this and got into a career in cannabis. And uh, this really informed uh, over the past seven years, this really informed um, my thoughts and, and just gave me experience for the psychedelic industry and to apply what I learned in uh, helping the cannabis industry go from uh, gray to medical to legal and try and help with that transition in the psychedelic space. And uh, currently, I'm the co-founder and uh, chief research officer of Haven Life Sciences, a psychedelic company that we grow uh, and cultivate mushrooms in Jamaica and ship to uh, Health Canada and DEA licensed laboratories. Well, I thought we were going to transition on the word transition, but now we're doing laboratories. So, uh, Mr. Lucas, uh, they both start with now. Can you please introduce yourself here? Patrick. Uh, my name is Lucas McCann. Uh, I'm also a chemist. Um, I went to university for about 13 years and uh, committed a lot of money uh, to uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, following my uh, more formative uh, academic career, I ended up at Health Canada in the health products branch uh, under the regulatory operations and enforcement branch uh, located in uh, Toronto. I uh, worked there for a while. Um, found the work there to be very interesting, uh, very uh, engaging, um, but um, decided to part ways with the public sector and co-founded with another Health Canada employee from the medical cannabis program, uh, Can Delta, which is a regulatory and scientific cannabis focused uh, consulting firm that also has done some work in the psychedelic space. Um, so over the last, I would say, year and a half, there has been some increased interest in our client base for uh, looking at uh, the quote unquote psychedelics industry. Um, folks, I think from what I've seen are very curious about what that uh, can evolve into, what it will change into. And I hope to uncover some of that uh, during the panel today. Um, and yeah, happy to uh, to speak also from the perspective of a chemist, along with uh, some other accomplished folks on today's call. So happy to be here. So you guys are telling me that I'm the only not chemist on this panel? <laughs> Any kind of degree or accreditation to call yourself a scientist. So in theory, we're all scientists in life. So uh, you're, uh, you're amongst friends here, Patrick. 
I, I am a scientist. Um, <laughs> leave the scientist uh, stuff to you guys. You forgot the UCAN Academy there, which I thought was one of the most important points, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that there. Um, so you guys all clearly have experience in cannabis, in psychedelics, and you know, one of the talking points early on when we saw the industry emerge was, okay, what are the similarities? What are the differences? And, and you know, how is this going to roll out? And how is it going to be the same? How is it going to be different? So uh, maybe Lucas, since you did the last intro, we can start with you. And I feel like that's probably a question that everyone can touch on. So we'll go Lucas, Alex, Samantha. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think the um, the comparison of psychedelics and psychedelic medicines, psychedelic assisted therapies to something we know in terms of its its sort of regulatory stand standing point with Health Canada uh, is, is something that I guess is very easy to do, uh, largely because like the cannabis path has been very well understood. Um, they have taken, I would say, largely different directions in the the last uh, the last number of months, especially. Um, but you know, to to sort of go back to what the cannabis path looked like, um, we had a court ruling in '97 at the Superior Court, Ontario Superior Court level, which led to an access to cannabis as medicine pathway, and. <clears throat> Spurring from that were, uh, were folks looking to access cannabis effectively through what's called a Section 56 exemption of Part J um, of the CDSA, um, which would allow for folks to acquire access to these products um, for medicinal purposes. Um, but very, uh, very shortly after that, a number of years after that uh, Ontario Superior Court ruling in 2001, we began to see um, the MMAR come into effect, which is a program that allowed, allowed for personal use and production of cannabis products. Uh, where we're at today is, if, if we can call it even a psychedelics industry, is very much at its infancy. Um, we've already seen some divergence of the path from cannabis, but you know, are, are ex excited from some of the, I think, important benchmarks um, that we've taken or that we, we, we've seen sort of this, uh, um, this particular treatment pathway taken the last little while uh, through the Section 56 exemption as a starting point and then through other um, programs for access, such as the SAP or Special Access Program. So in short, uh, they have sort of an initial starting point, but it looks like it, it's diverging a little bit into uh, into how it's being regulated, controlled, and how uh, folks that are requiring its use are, are acquiring access. Beautiful. Uh, so we've got the in short. Uh, Alex, do you want to do the in long or? Uh, yeah. So in addition to what Lucas was saying, um, the similarities are that both were controlled substances and both have communities of people um, speaking to its efficacy in some kind of um, medical therapy. And I think that that gives people the idea that they're going to track exactly the same way. Um, and much like the phrase history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. I think it's a very similar case here with cannabis and uh, psychedelics, particularly uh, psilocybin and MDMA, um, where with psilocybin, it's a natural product. Um, people seem to have a reaction to nat wanting natural therapies rather than pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so I think where it will track is that these are controlled substances that were typically thought to be just recreational, had no medical benefit. We are now finding medical benefits. We have scientific studies that show the efficacy of this. And in a lot of cases, psychedelics have shown better efficacy than cannabis for treatment of anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, end of life anxiety is a very particularly big one uh, for palliative care patients. Um, where I think it will diverge is the regulations and uh, where the pathway um, happened with uh, cannabis um, won't exactly line up with psychedelics. But what I think needs to happen in order for there to be an industry that was um, analogous to medical cannabis is um, allowing doctors to authorize patients for medical use similarly. And that would then give companies like uh, ha Haven or Filament or any other bigger companies um, that are in the psychedelic space a revenue stream to keep the industry going. I think in psychedelics, we kind of did it a little backwards in a way um, where with cannabis, you had personal 
growth. And then there was, you can designate a grower for you to grow. And then under the Harper government, they had changed that and then said, corporations are going to be highly regulated. And then these will then provide the medicine for the patients. Um, and I think now we have, we, did, we, we never had the uh, component in the psychedelic industry where we were given access to grow ourselves and, and all this en masse by doctors. Um, so I think that's where the first thing has to change is the ability for the patients to actually be authorized to possess and or create or buy from a uh, company uh, like mine that is regulated, go, goes through regulatory approvals uh, and make sure that everything is um, lab spec and GMP spec. So good transition on the on the regulated and you know kind of GMP lab science side. We talked a lot there about the you know the political and the commercial industrial side. Uh, Samantha, do you want to maybe touch on the scientific difference between uh, cannabis and psychedelics and kind of what's happening there? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think it's fair to say that these are both considered high interest substances. You know, not all psychedelics can be derived from a natural source, but most can, the first generation psychedelics. So there's obviously a natural similarity there, no pun intended. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the differences, the two categories that I see as kind of standing out as where these could also diverge from each other, psychedelics and cannabis, that is, um, is the basic research in general that is being done in the preclinical and discovery environment, not just for drug development, mind you, um, but for other things as well. But uh, in, in addition to that, of course, is the potential, the clinical potential, as uh, Alex sagely put, it's obvious that there is a lot more evidence for therapeutic efficacy involving these psychedelic compounds. Uh, if we boil it down to first principles, is that because the key receptors are not ubiquitous, such as the CB1 and CB2 receptors for cannabinoids? Probably. Um, but, you know, in terms of where this goes, when I mention basic research, I think that psychedelics in particular have really unique properties. I'm sure many of you uh, listening have heard about the, the term structural and functional neuroplasticity and how psychedelics have shown in vitro that this uh, happens when, you know, psychedelics are administered to some kind of neuron. Uh, what that means is that not only do these have potential for clinical utility, but if you talk to, you know, a bench side neuroscientist, these have an immense, immense potential to be used as a tool to understand uh, mechanisms of action of the different classes of psychoactives and to also be used as a tool to understand the pathophysiology of different complex neurological disorders, which I feel is a really untapped subset of psychedelic biotech that hasn't actually started yet. So there's a lot of excitement. I mean, we can talk about the different structures, but I think in a nutshell, it's safe to say that both are psychoactive. However, you know, you have psychedelics exhibiting a whole um, plethora of scientific characteristics and bioactivity that just aren't there for cannabis. Does that relate to potentially scientists not fully understanding why we have or what the endocannabinoid system is? How would you clarify that? So do you mean, do you mean to say that um, maybe we just don't have enough information about the endocannabinoid system yet. Yeah, like like serotonin, dopamine, you know, the 5-HT2AB and C receptors, a lot of research already done on those, but, you know, the endocannabinoid system is still relatively a bit of a mystery. That's a really good point. I think looking at the molecular biology of endocannabinoid systems in general, it's really obvious that these receptors are pretty much everywhere in the body. And if I look at it in a very simple way, um, serotonergic receptors are located mainly in the gut and the brain. Um, but you know, there's always the possibility that we don't know something. And when it comes to just the serotonergic system, psychedelics really are serotonergics because that's what they've been proven out to be. But perhaps cannabinoids and psychedelics are also, you know, really potent. Um, cholinergics or adrenergics or, you know, 
some other type of major neurotransmitter ligand, which we know they are, but as the if evidence accumulates, typically, you know, um, there is always a way to kind of push the direction of, in which the science goes, which requires funding, but it also uh, requires incentive to do the basic research, which is another rabbit hole that I'll, I'll save for another time. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah. guys, I hope you're proud of me. I just did a science um, and I got $20, but I don't think that's going to be enough to fund your research. So oh, yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> um, Alex, I'm going to head over to you with, you know, a question around the the, the hype cycle, you know, uh, regarding these emerging markets. We saw very clear indicators in early cannabis, you know, a lot of RTOs, shell corporations, that kind of thing similar behavioral patterns, especially, you know, if you watch Twitter and that's where you get all your information like me, um, what, what are the similarities and differences that you're seeing, you know, in the, the early emergence of the cannabis market, you know, 2016, 2017, and then early emergence of the psychedelic markets, you know, a la mind meta to tie compass? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And one that I think a lot of investors, once they saw what happened with cannabis, especially in the early days, um, if we rewind back to that time, uh, right around that time, um, Justin Trudeau uh, was coming out with a platform um, which was brought to the liberal convention by, I believe, the student faction to put it as a liberal policy. They put it to a vote and then it became liberal policy. So I think right at that beginning stage, there wasn't a guarantee that there would be a legal cannabis industry. So a lot of companies had experienced a great amount of um, investment, and then there was a bit, a bit of a lull. And then when, once the liberals, once the Trudeau got in, the liberals were really pushing cannabis as a platform. And especially once they got in, I think that's when a lot of money got thrown in there. And we had evaluations that were just silly, billion dollar companies, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, worth of valuations on um, a room no bigger than mine, uh, that, but it had a company that had a license. So there was this whole potential. Um, and there was a lot of fervor, but cannabis was very different because there was a established medical program. There was still revenue generation with the patients. Then once legalization came in, there was this whole population, which was potential for revenue generation. I think with psychedelics, there was that hype where this is another a uh, legal substance or controlled substance that is now being brought in to the uh, wider society, but that's happening very differently than it did cannabis. So I think there was an initial hype and you saw this in the investment um, last year or the year prior, there was a huge investment, a huge bubble for about anywhere between three to six months, depending on which company you're really looking at, but really about two months focused around December, January, uh, February ish of uh, 2021, there was a huge influx of money. And I think this is where the hype bubble came in. But I think once investors realized that it's not like cannabis, we don't have an established medical um, uh, program yet, we don't really have many sources of revenue. Um, I think that's where a lot of the hype bubble got burst. Um, what companies like Haven, Compass, Filament, um, SciGen, and MindMed and others, um, what we are, we're kind of the vanguard of this industry. We're trying things out. We're experimenting. We're seeing if uh, production works. We're also really hoping for some kind of a catalyst, some change with the government, um, some allowance for patients to access this, hopefully through authorization um, by the doctors. Uh, that would be the easiest route. But really what we're looking for is a catalyst for this hype to continue to build. Well, <laughs> would you look at that, a Segui. Um, speaking of catalysts and excitement, Lucas, we, you know, initially saw a lot of interest around the C56 exemptions, you know, they're not being granted as easily as they were originally. Um, do you think this has had any significant impact in terms of like the potential of the market in Canada internationally or, or otherwise on a recreational basis even? Oh, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, maybe I'll start by writing Alex's coattails for a little bit and talking about uh, the shared experience from the um, from the the flash in the pan of hype that we we I think we're all seeing over the last year or so. Um, from a, um, a a licensing professional perspective, there were a number of folks that were approaching us looking to acquire 
uh, Section 56 exemptions under Part J of the Food and Drugs Act and, and, and looking at getting dealers licenses. And we um, have knowledge that there are, I think, in Canada alone, approximately 52 companies that IPO'd that uh, have some, um, some sort of service offering within the, the psychedelic sector. Uh, many of those companies, again, are not brick and mortar spaces or um, Probably a lot of them even just exist solely on a on a on a slide deck, um, and have uh, you know garnered the attention of many many investors. Um, that uh, that did sort of tend to fizzle out at the beginning of this year. Uh, also, coincidentally, from uh, from last year to this year, we've had some very important changes to how um, patients specifically are acquiring access to these controlled substances, uh, namely uh, uh, psilocybin. So, just very quickly, the the Section fifty six exemption. Um, would allow for folks to acquire access for um, uh, controlled substances. Um, it could be for a, a person, an individual, or a group of people, such as for a clinical trial, um, you know, effectively allowing under, you know, careful control and supervision with, a, you know, a, a many times a protocol being reviewed, um, a, a condition in which this could um, um, provide some sort of sh short term um, access to these folks. And with the influx of requests for exemptions uh, that came in specifically around psilocybin, I mean, from a regulatory perspective, we saw Health Canada really pump the brakes and say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Um, from that, there was the um, the inception of a new program on January 5th of 22 um, called the Special Access Program. Um, and what happened was Health Canada then cancelled all of the pending Section 56 exemptions that had been filed for uh, largely were, were, were patients looking to acquire access for uh, end of life anxiety treatments um, that was, you know, experimental or potentially even anecdotal in, in Health Canada's opinion, or folks looking to, <clears throat> to treat some kind of other ailment for which other um, other treatments had failed. Um, uh, TRD is another one, treatment resistant depression. Um, you know, effectively folks that were um, you know, looking at it, it, what, what few options they had left to deal with whatever, you know, mental health or, or other ailment issues that they have. And we, kn we know from the studies that, uh, that have been done at Johns Hopkins University that, you know, psilocybin um, uh, assisted therapy can be used from anything from uh, treating depression to uh, helping folks cope with tobacco or alcohol cessation. There's, there's a wide range and it's one of the only substances that actually provide acute long lasting effects after a sole treatment. Um, so these cancelled 56 exemptions, um, uh, the applicants were then told to reapply under uh, the, the special access program, and, uh, and, and, and that took a, a, serious, a seriously long time for, uh, for, for those applications to sort of move through the pipeline. Um, with the creation of that that program, um, you know, it does require again practitioner oversight. And um, funny enough, the the applications themselves, I believe, still to this day for the SAP are actually submitted by fax, which Health Canada is a big fan of. They see that as a very secure method of of communication. Um, right. So so getting back to that, you know, having a a, a pathway that is designed for um, for. Uh, uh, for for folks requiring access to medicine with practitioner oversight, I think has created a lot of hype uh, in 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 the industry. Again, um, you know, we're not necessarily seeing that from the from the publicly traded perspective, but much more from I guess like an ethical perspective for allowing folks to to get access to this medicine. Uh, very important follow up question: Who other than Health Canada requires you to fax them these days? Okay, next question. <laughs> um, Samantha, we, we, you know, we talked about the SAP and the Section P C-56. Recent news, um, you know, Theracil launched a, 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 you know, fundamental charter challenge against Health Canada, uh, you know, kind of following, I mean, almost literally the exact same playbook as uh, cannabis in, in 97. Same lawyers, you know, same kind of, you know, language for, for that. What are your thoughts on, uh, you know, this approach to getting psilocybin and other psychedelics uh, sort of move forward in Canada? I'll start by saying that I think Theracil is very well intentioned and that they mean well. Um, I had the privilege of getting to know one of their, um, one of their employees who had called me to see if the company that I was with at the time wanted to make a donation uh, to support the legal fees 
uh, in the battle against Health Canada. And at the time, uh, the company that I was working with had already had a dealer's license and there was a whole research and development portfolio around, you know, the development of um, both natural products and also synthetics. And so I was in the weeds with the comparisons between what a natural chemical is defined as uh, versus semi-synthetic. And I, I was really trying to understand whether or not Health Canada had that language. So, you know, I, I personally feel that they went about this the wrong way. I think that from my correspondence and direct dialogue with many of the directors at the Office of Controlled Substances, it was pretty clear to me that they were trying to elicit as much information as possible from different groups of experts, uh, different professional consultancy groups, and different scientists to make sure that they were always informed. And I don't think that launching a lawsuit against a, a government entity in the middle of them trying to elicit this type of information from public sector, private companies, scientists alike was productive. Uh, and I think it did actually antagonize Health Canada in a way that may or may not have influenced their decision to slow or quicken their pace with regulatory uh, adjustments. Uh, I'm not a policy expert and I'm not a regulatory expert, but from the outside looking in as somebody who is always communicating with Health Canada to try and give them information about the science um, and pointing them in the right direction of who else could give them that info, um, I think it may have worked against the general community of psychedelic science, which indirectly affects access to patients in the long run. Lucas, being that you were in the belly of the beast uh, for a little while, you know, being a policy regulatory expert, what's your sort of thoughts on on that, uh, that line of questioning? Yeah, so Health Canada's mandates don't necessarily align with um, mandates of supporting businesses. Um, it, it's not Health Canada's responsibility to make sure that, for example, if we're talking about the cannabis yeah. industry, that, uh, that businesses survive or, or do well. Um, they're really out there to look out for the health and safety of, of, of Canadians and, and, and ensure that, you know, uh, regulated and controlled substances, you know, are, are, are not going down, you know, the illicit market channels and they're, they're staying well away from, from young persons. Um, so when we approach Health Canada with sort of that adversarial tone, um, I mean, with any government regulator, I, I think the natural reaction is to sort of lock up and to really, um, you know, or regress from the conversation. And I, I think that um, in cases where we're, we're pointing fingers that uh, it can be very difficult, I think, to sort of get business done, which is why I think companies that focus with government relations probably um, have sort of a very special niche carved out for themselves. You know, when you're, when you're working with evidence-based entities or fact-based entities, you really have to put the science first. And uh, that's, I think, a really important consideration. Um, you know, you you do have to show evidence, and um, in, in a lot of the conversations that we've had with Health Canada about what you know potential uh, entries into phase three or um, even phase two clinical trials look like, I, I think there is a general amount of, uh, a, a, I guess, sort of acceptance of the past work that's been done in the sector, and, and you being able to leverage that. Um, to be able to allow other companies to leverage the work of others so that, you know, they're not necessarily required to do everything from scratch. And, and I, I think that's significant. And I think the, the conversation that Health Canada has been in about potentially allowing for um, naturally sourced sort of what we call a full spectrum uh, product in, in things like uh, or in events like clinical trials is also significant as opposed to perhaps using, you know, pure compounds, which I think sort of goes traditionally against what we've always looked at when, when, when doing what we call sort of drug investigations for clinical trials. Um, and, you know, for those that aren't aware, you know, for, for probably many or um, all products typically historically, you know, our, our pure API is active pharmaceutical ingredients. So to su suggest a, 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 a mixture of natural products as a potential medicine, you know, is, is, is very counterintuitive to what uh, pharmaceutical science is, is really based on. You know, but those are conversations that Health Canada has, has, has considered and, you know, has been open to. And I, I think that, uh, you know, conversations surrounding um, the potential for like an entourage effect with, with these compounds um, and the receptiveness from Health Canada shows that there is a willingness to work with uh, 
folks from the scientific community that have seen um, seen evidence that those might be more effective in the long run for, um, uh, I guess, medical uh, medical guided or medical mediated therapies. Fair enough. It seems like a bit of a, a tale as old as the the tortoise and the hare, and uh, we'll see how it works out on this one. Um, this will be a bit of an all call question. So you know, partnerships are pretty clearly going to be key to this industry. You know, it takes a village resources combined uh help move things forward faster you know charities and, and academic institutions they've been really leading the charge on this you look at a company like maps 37 years into you know taking it to the fda uh for for medical mdma for ptsd you know one great example you know you've got johns hopkins has been uh studying psychedelics for a long time there's government bodies that kind of thing so with you know recent examples of uh government sorry not government uh, partnerships being uh formed between you know these academic institutions and the for-profit companies uh what are some of the basic you know pieces of research and key components to these partnerships that are going to be needed to to move the research forward uh maybe alex you want to start on that one sure yeah i'd be happy to so <clears throat> When it comes to where we're at in the psychedelic industry, there definitely has to be a lot of work between the companies doing research within. Um, this will be trade secrets, but there will also be a ne um, necessity for companies to work with universities and then also other companies that are doing clinical trials to really understand um, the, uh, uh, the properties of the drug, uh, say psilocybin. Um, so for my company, we would want to understand how to best extract the um, the wanted components of the, the mushrooms into an extract or bring it all the way down to a single API of psilocybin or psilocin. Um, that will then be the starting material for making second and third generation drugs like derivatives. Um, one really easy one off the top of my head is methyl psilocin, which is said to have less hallucinogenic properties but is also said to help with migraines and cluster headaches, very similar to, to bromo LSD. So first we need to get to the, um, the product, the API, and then do work and research with um, universities. And a good example is we're working with a company called Revive Therapeutics, and they're engaged with a research project um, with the University of Wisconsin um, on a drug delivery methodology. So we will be supplying the psilocybin and psilocin uh, to Revive. Revive will provide it to the university, which has a license from the DEA to work with these uh, controlled compounds, and then see how they can best integrate it into a delivery system. And in their case, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a strip that would dissolve uh, into the skin. Um, but there's also other projects like nasal sprays, um, increasing the bioavailability. Um, there's a number of different ways we can take it, but the bottom line is we definitely need to have partnerships between um, industry, university, and governments where grants are, are, are allowed. One quick example is uh, Australia, where they have a number of different grants for investigating psychedelics um, for, for, for therapeutic and, and medicine. Beautiful. Um, Samantha, do you wanna tack onto that one there? Yeah, I think uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned grants because I do feel that grants are needed to really push forward a lot of positive collaboration in this space as it is. Um, but on the, the topic of partnerships within the, I guess, I don't want to polarize the space, but the far drug development side, uh, you know, the grassroots discovery medchem campaign companies uh, where there already exists quite a number of them, there doesn't seem to be much notion of what partnerships should look like beyond, you know, those academic affiliations. And I, I want to say something quite radical, which I think might be a bit um, new to some people, but in this, the world of drug development right now, when you're talking about these first generation psychedelics, then developing some new NCE that can be a prospective API, um, 
there's still a lot of basic research, and I'm going back to this element of basic research that, that needs to be done. And if we have all of these companies that have first-gen psychedelics ubiquitous in all of their pipelines, I mean, once a lot of these drugs become approved, if they do, um, there is going to be a small label prescribing happening, and then the competition, you know, kind of fizzles out a bit. But when it comes to partnering, I've seen companies in this space, whether they be analog manufacturers, uh, they, somebody that has a unique model or a unique in silico platform, or somebody that has a really interesting um, delivery system. The only type of partnerships I'm seeing are wait till we're done, out license our molecule, or wait till we're done, in license our delivery tech. And it's a very expensive process when in reality, there has to be a lot of work done right now um, to expand the indication pool be beyond what we see right now in the, in the neuropsychiatric realm. And I'm getting a little bit out there because again, psychedelics are so amazing. They can be used as a tool. And I think if different pathways, GABAergic system, cholinergic system, you know, other neurotransmitter systems are looked at, and people are starting to be open now to sharing data a little bit. Although you're in a for-profit sector, sharing data is important when there's there's so much science that needs to be done. There really needs to be some positive partnership happening between for-profit companies. Um, all of that to say that I truly think the future of psychedelic medicine on the synthetic side will have to do with sharing models sharing therapeutic efficacy data, and really realizing that not everybody can develop 50 million drugs at once. You know, it, it's so expensive that to land grab, you know, patents all over the place for the same receptor system and drug target is a little bit out there. Um, and, you know, I, I think partnerships as far as clinical trials go are already happening with the big four of psychedelics. I believe there's a lot of overlap there on the drug development side. Um, but, you know, kind of reverting back to the comment that Lucas had made about APIs typically being like one molecule and to consider a mixture of substances, you know, Health Canada seems open, but we're not there yet. That's going to require partnerships. And you know, it's not not doable, but it's going to require collaboration with brilliant people like Alex, who's looking at doing this already and establishing a new standard. Um, so obviously you could see I'm very passionate about this, but, you know, industrial R&D is difficult because you need to protect your trade secret to remain valuable. Maybe this requires a dogmatic shift in the way that pharmaceutical companies are evaluated. Yeah. Beautiful. Um... Lucas, do you want to sort of tie a bow on that one for us? The folks that will be leaders in this space <clears throat> are ones that will be able to tie a claim uh, to these these compounds. Once we have sort of some indications on um, on the use of compounds like psilocin or psilocybin, um, those folks I think will really be the ones that will end up winning in this uh, this prospective industry that we're looking at. Uh, just like any industry, um, this one uh, you know requires entrepreneurs to to enter the space and for folks to really take a chance. Um, I mean, it's a very calculated risk based on the amount of research that we've seen and the encouraging and you know results from the research. Um, I, I think that, you know, again, it, it, it's very, very early, but um, it, it is going to require a heavy amount of investment to sort of get to that point. It's, it's, it's one that has potential for some very uh, strong um, and, and consistent uh, revenue models. And, you know, in, in a time where aspects such as mental health are ones that are, you know, really being um, um, Put top of mind um, that it, it seems very timely that uh, you know the, the psilocybin research that we've we've been seeing in the clinical trial applications that have been going through uh, CTA meetings is uh, you know it, it all seems very well aligned with sort of where folks are at. I mean uh, you know as a as a society we've been faced with many many pressures over the last couple of years to be able to continue to perform at the same levels of productivity regardless of the the situation with pandemics and world wars, um, and it's it's interesting to see that there might be. You know, additional medicine that folks can 
access when you know folks sort of become at their wits end with things, uh, or um, you know they're they're perhaps facing something a little bit more serious. I, I think one of the the bigger take home messages that I wanted to give here is that um, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's considerable amounts of ailments that you know psilocybin has been um, anecdotally. Um, associated with being able to help uh, either with in, in, as a treatment or even the potential for for certain cures and the the framework that we have now really limits that access to folks that are basically end of life you know and could you imagine if you could just instead of picking up a patch uh, to quit smoking um, you know pick up a pill and then the next day you had zero desire to smoke a cigarette again, you know, what the impacts would be on, on, on health and, and the safety of, uh, of, of Canadians or the, the population of the world, it would be significant. Um, but as things are today, it, it's unfortunate that you really have to be basically on a deathbed before you can uh, even um, be eligible uh, to get access uh, to experiment with some of these, these, these medicines. Yeah. I mean, I'd take a, pretty hard and strong stance on that personally, not from a regulatory or political or anything stance, but, you know, criminalizing somebody's consciousness is just downright wrong in my, in my opinion, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of while we're doing the science, you know, while we're medicalizing and that kind of thing, making somebody a criminal for changing the way that they think or see things and all that is just outright outrageous in, in, in my opinion, you know, like these things, most of them, you know, they're not plant medicine, you know, fun, fun, uh, the mycelium network, it's not a plant, MDMA isn't a plant, but I like to call it planet medicine. And, you know, if I want to explore the orbit on my own time, and as long as it doesn't hurt anyone or, or you know, offend anyone, that kind of thing, I think it, it honestly, it should, it should just be moved along in a more expedient manner. I mean, me personally, I tripped on um, psychedelic truffles for the first time in Amsterdam a decade ago and didn't ruin my life. It didn't, you know, cause any upset. It actually kind of made my life a whole lot better. And here I am running a psychedelic media company, who to thunk, you know, so <laughs> that while I understand the need for, for this, you know, really rigorous approach, I think at, at the same time, if you look at it, you know, reduced burden on the criminal justice system, reduced burden on the healthcare system, reduced burden on the political system, my kind of big picture thinking here is not, you know, and, and not to say that it's not a, a really great path to, bring this to people that need it the most, but what happens when you better the well, you know, what happens when people really get to that next level and you're reducing kind of the negative impact of uh, drug criminalization all over the world. So that's just kind of my uh, two cents on the topic, but there's 98 left to go. Um, so that's a lot on the, the, the science, the regulatory and that kind of thing. Um, Alex, you know, speaking of, you know, the market and, and, you know, companies emerging and trying to make money and needing to make money, what are different ways that psychedelic companies can actually generate revenue now while these things are criminalized? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, which requires a little bit of creativity to keep the company going. Um, Cause unless you get a huge influx of cash and you spend it very wisely and lower your cash burn to, create that uh, longevity in the company. Um, there is very few revenue opportunities at this very moment. We need to have some kind of a catalyst, a change in regulations to allow access to psychedelics in order for there to be a large revenue stream, um, very much like there was with the medical cannabis program. So with Haven, I can speak from our experience. Um, we, at the very beginning of our inception, had thought of creating a NHP division that will sell functional mushrooms, lion's mane, turkey tail, chaga. Um, we have seven products um, and we've been able to uh, onboard natural health product specialists and people who have experience with the regulatory applications um, and then the distribution. We've been able to get on Amazon and Well and uh, uh, Choices Nestor and uh, a number of different companies were, were growing every day. So this, this was just one creative solution to, uh, as a revenue stream to keep the company going. Well, especially the hype has come down from the stock, uh, the stock market, uh, of the stock potential of these companies. Um, another smaller re uh, revenue generation is, of course, feeding into the clinical trials and scientific research studies 
and selling to other companies that are wanting to engage in either their own extract programs or their own development programs of novel products or novel delivery methods. Um, but again, these aren't large orders. We're looking at um, gram level, low kilogram level, and uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, right now um, with that. But the last thing is um, if you're operating within a country that has um, either unregulated or legalized uh, treatment centers, uh, Jamaica is one of these places where it is not necessarily regulated. Um, so it's a fairly open industry. This is also another revenue stream. But again, with a smaller country, um, it's not going to generate millions of dollars or billions of dollars uh, at this time. We really need regulations to change and shift. Quite true. Um, so it's pretty evident from this conversation that, you know, while the cannabis emergency, uh, sorry, industry, it's not an emergency. Don't worry, it'll relax. <laughs> uh, you know, the Feels cannabis like has, has been developed and, and uh you know, is really kind of taking a life form of its own, the psychedelic industry in a sense, um, while it had a movement in the 60s and went backwards. And, you know, we're just kind of coming back out of that here. It's in its early stages. There's a lot of startups, you know, kind of finding their way, exploring new paths. You know, there's 25 companies doing psilocybin for depression. There's one interesting company that I uh, just spoke with that's actually, you know, studying DMT for hemorrhagic strokes at microdose levels, who to thunk. Um, Samantha, given your expertise in sort of early stage and consulting and probably a lot of conversations with industry experts and executives and that kind of thing, what's some maybe cautionary advice or just general, you know, get ahead advice that you might give to some of these companies trying to carve out a path and be successful moving forward? I mean, the first thing I'll say is that I think Lucas also mentioned 52 public companies. Are they are those all on the Canadian Securities Exchange? Way okay. more now. Yeah. Yep. And I think about 500 patents have been filed. Yeah. So, I mean, look, there's a playbook that's obviously been replicated by the same type of investor at the very beginning of this hype that moved over from cannabis to psychedelics. It's really obvious. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, I think for those trying to enter the space now, I think we're on the cusp of an emerging industry and the industry is to be defined. Um, I see all existing companies falling into an already existing industry, whether that be pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, telehealth, um, healthcare. And I mean, it's not to say that there isn't room for this to become a full-fledged space. I think that for those that have an idea, perhaps looking at your team, looking at your expertise and figuring out what your proof of concept is gonna be is your first step and then assessing the competition. Um, the, the only real like truly novel, I think, um, deliverable that a company in this space can give is the production of a mushroom product because nobody's done that before. Um, but I think to say to a, a group of individuals that are really gung-ho about developing a mushroom product to wait until the regulations change, perhaps reverting to first principles and doing some basic R&D might give you some new ideas. And it also might help a strategic advantage kind of take shape. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention around hype too, is if you meet a consultant that tells you your company is worth a billion dollars, it's not just be cautious. Tell them to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all I'll say. Beautiful. Um, well, I did, um, just kind of get the, the 45 minute cue for this panel, I think. And I, I forgot to introduce myself at the. Uh, beginning of the interview, I'm Patrick. I'm from Microdose uh, Psychedelic Insights. We do some of the world's leading uh, psychedelic conferences. So if anyone wants to uh, check that out, our next conference will be in Miami, Wonderland, November 3rd to 5th. And we'll have some of the world's leading experts uh, speaking there. We actually, um, oh, wait, we haven't announced that yet. I can't say that. Sorry. Um, Thank you guys. Thank you, Lucas, Alex, Samantha, for uh, your expert insights. Uh, really appreciate you kind of just coming on, dropping knowledge, not, you know, 
diverting away from any of these questions or insights or uh, you know polarizing subjects because it's I think always important to have kind of an open forum of communication and, and candor and you know we're we're building something uh, relatively from scratch here you know there's decades and millennia of, of uh, you know tradition and knowledge that's uh, being passed down and now we kind of have this suits in the roots moment where the the suits are coming so the roots have to kind of teach them a little bit about what's what's up and and integrate build bridges don't burn them so I uh, appreciate your insights. Thank you to AAPS for putting this on. And, uh, you know, if you guys want to say any final words, uh, now is the time. Sounds like we're good. Thank you, Thanks, folks. Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.